I don't want to scare anyone. But I'm going to give it to you straight about Jason. Golden Spiral Media presents the Friday the 13th rewatch. Jason, mother is talking to you. Join Corey and Nathan each week as they slash their way through campgrounds, woods, Manhattan, hell, and space as they discuss another installment in the Friday the 13th franchise. Hey, wasn't that the road up for Camp Crystal Lake back there? Send us your feedback at goldenspiralmedia.com forward slash feedback. Like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash rewatch podcast. And follow us on Twitter at rewatch pod. Legend has it that Jason came back to get you. Every now and then, the murders just start up. Today we're discussing Friday the 13th, part 8. Jason takes a boat ride, then spends 20 minutes in New York. I mean, Jason takes Manhattan. <laughs> Starring Jensen Daggett, Peter Mark Richmond, Scott Reeves, Barbara Bingham, Martin Cummins, Gordon Curry, Alex Diakon, V.C. Dupree, and Saffron Henderson, with, again, Kane Hodder as Jason. Directed by Rob Hedden. Welcome back to the Rewatch Podcast. I'm Corey, and you can't get the adrenaline pumping without the terror, good people. And I love this town. And I'm Nathan. And you're all gonna die. You're the last ones. He come back for ya. <laughs> <laughs> How did I know you were gonna go with that deckhand? I know. he. Re- I really got into character then, didn't I? <laughs> Let me ask you a question, Corey, before we get too far. Why do people that we've never heard of star in these movies and never hear from again? This is a good point. All of those movies, so all of those stars that you kind of read out for Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan, I've never heard of any of these guys. I think there's one actor, I think Kelly Hugh is in this film. She was the only woman that I recognised. Well, what about uh, what about the teacher guy? Oh, well, that's true. Yeah, yeah. We, we were talking off mic that the, the teacher guy who was a... Uh, played by Peter Mark Richmond. I can't remember his character name, but um, he actually star- was not starred, but he was actually in Naked Gun, the first one and the sequel. So he was a familiar face, that guy. He, he's kind of like one of those it guys that you kind of always recognize, but you don't really know exactly where from, yeah? And I have to say, it's a crime against nature that Saffron Henderson, as JJ in this movie, did not go on to bigger and better things. <laughs> Fair enough. nice okay so uh before we get into anything of course as always we want to remind our listeners that we're part of the golden spiral media podcast network where you can send us your feedback at goldenspiralmedia.com slash feedback type out a message or use the speak pipe widget so we can hear your voice and play it back on the show you can also call 304-837-2278 and also head over to facebook.com slash golden spiral media and follow on twitter at gsm podcasts another good way to get the word out there to people is tell your friends all of them tell the person that you sit next to at work about the great podcast you listen to Exactly. Get the word out there. It helps. It really does. It helps us a lot. So yeah, do it. Golden Sparrow Media's got heaps of stuff to listen to. Enough for everybody. Do they ever? Seriously, it's just a, it's a plethora of shows. All right, so let's get into this week's movie and begin with the trailer. No worries. Welcome back. Friday the 13th, 
Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. We were only joking earlier on about the whole Jason Takes a Boat Ride. Obviously, we'll kind of get more into the discussion as the as this show kind of goes on. But to cut a long story short, it's called Jason Takes Manhattan. They make a big point in this film that it's called Jason Takes Manhattan. But yet, you only spend about 20 to 30 minutes in Manhattan at the end of the film, but we'll we'll get into it. Anyway, Friday the 13th, Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan, was released on July 28th, 1989, and the film grossed $14.3 million in the US box office off a budget of about $5 million. So the, the budgets keep kind of going up slowly. I don't really know why, because these films don't make much money. It's kind of in their interest to, to kind of keep the budget small. But this was actually the second lowest US gross in the series. Along with this, it was actually panned very heavily by critics, making it the worst reviewed installment in the franchise. Now, this opened, as we said, on July 28th, and some of the competition it was up against in the box office at the time was Turner and Hooch. That debuted on the same weekend as this film. Lethal Weapon 2 was number two at the box office. Batman was number three. That was in its sixth week of release when Harry met Sally and Friday the 13th Part 8 came in at number 5. Even films like License to Kill, the new Bond film, was in its third week of release. Indiana Jones was out at the same time. So, you know, we've mentioned this a billion times, but pretty stiff competition for the eighth film in a horror franchise, yeah? Yeah, this was definitely not going to outdo Batman. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god that was huge like and when i say huge like we're not joking in the sixth week of release when this came out it it had grossed 200 million dollars in in 1989 money that's enormous money and like i think batman was a big budget but i don't think it was like for the day i don't think it was like a hundred million dollars or anything like that like i think it was probably more hovering about the 50 60 million dollar mark that's probably where it probably was sitting but for it to make 200 million dollars is ginormous and that's just domestic gross we're not talking about worldwide box office are we yeah exactly so when you look at this film you know those early installments i mean paramount was making money hand over fist they were breaking in their investment tenfold and here we Mm. are part eight and it barely triples its money i mean you know it's nothing to scoff at 14.3 million dollars on a five million investment but still that is nowhere near what it used to be and of course this is the last go around for paramount at this point after this film, the rights get sold off to New Line. Yep, yep. Well, the director of this film was a guy named Rob Hedden, who had actually previously worked as a writer for Paramount on the show MacGyver. But what he really wanted to do was actually direct. So when the studio actually asked him to write for the Friday the 13th, the series, he'd only do it if he could also direct. Apparently, the, the studio hated the sound of that, but they actually gave him a chance. And then he actually ended up directing two episodes of the TV series. And they were. were impressed enough with it they actually gave him the job to actually write and direct part eight now it's something that i need to talk to you about because i actually know very little and i've done bugger all research into the friday the 13th tv show because that had obviously started by this stage i actually looked at it briefly today and i noticed that the friday the 13th series was on for three seasons i think there was something like 76 episodes or something like that so it clearly had like a bit of a following on TV as well. Yeah, I didn't really realize that. Did you? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I know a little bit about it. I haven't really seen the series. I watched like half of the first episode. It's got nothing to do with Jason. It's like they just slapped the name Friday the 13th on it and made some TV show about relics in some sort of antique store or something. And each week, another relic would do something, you know, raise a mummy or oh. something like that. And these people would work out the problem and then we just go on to the next week for some reason in my mind i thought it was like some kind of anthology kind of show like a different scenario for each episode but clearly not like an antique shop and really <laughs> something like, like Friday that, the 13th yeah. that that just sounds weird man. <laughs> yeah you know, i guess you know this director rob Haddon worked on that a little bit and more power to him he got a directing job doing part eight yeah well this is what he'll be remembered for because i don't think he made much else to be fair like i probably shouldn't kind of dismiss him that much he's done quite a bit of tv and he did some star trek and written a few things as well but nothing that's kind of going to like knock your socks off if you know what i mean so i guess getting into the behind the scenes of what's going on here
here, we were talking about how very little of this film actually takes place in New York. And there's, you know, there's a few things going on behind the scenes with that. And of course, originally the script had a lot more of New York in it. Had all kinds of locales around New York involved in the script. And the higher-ups at Paramount were like, no, we can't really budget for that. So extensive rewrites came around and a lot more of the script took place on this cruise ship. Yeah, well, uh, they, they kind of have set their sights fairly high. I mean, the, the scenes that were taking place in New York were at places like, obviously, the, the landmarks that we all know, like Empire State Building, Brooklyn Bridge, Madison Square Garden. But to be truthful, man, I would have been happy just to see Jason walk around the street because I'm going to be honest with you, like right now, Corey, the second half of this film is way better than the first half way better as soon as jason gets to manhattan the film actually kind of takes another like it it kind of energizes itself a little bit and it turns into this different kind of animal all of a sudden and i was way more engaged in the second half than i was the first the interesting thing is that even most of the manhattan stuff wasn't even shot in manhattan it was actually shot in toronto canada and the only thing they really shot there was times square When you actually need an iconic New York landmark like Times Square, of course, you have to shoot there. But, yeah, all the stuff running around the back alleys and in the sewers, that's all Toronto, Canada. Yeah, and I think it was refreshing to kind of get away from Crystal Lake. And I noticed Rob Hedden, um, one of his criteria to the producers was to say, look... Can I, can I get Jason away from the lake just for once? <laughs> and they, they did agree to it, but they kind of couldn't work out where to kind of go. And obviously, you know, they said, oh, let's get him to the city. And obviously Manhattan or New York City was the, was the clear choice. So it was not, kind of nice to see Jason in a completely new environment. And the boat was okay. It wasn't awful. It just, it just wasn't very exciting, was it? <laughs> yeah, we'll get into it. But, you know, at the same time, you know, they were butting heads with the New York City tourists committee as well you know of course the movie's called jason takes manhattan they want to try and sell that point so you know there was a lot of advertisements posters stuff like that of jason like slashing through the i love new york logo with the bloody knife and stuff and it you know it would start with oh you know the bloody knife's a bit too much so let's just have it be a clean knife but then this uh, tourism committee's also like we can't have jason slashing through our slogan So, no, you can't do that either. So, you know, it got a bit tough. They did manage to come out with a very good trailer, though. It's pretty much like the iconic trailer for this. It's pretty much just New York, New York playing as it slowly pans down to Jason standing in front of the New York skyline. And that's that's pretty much it. This stuff always kind of makes me laugh a little bit because in the original script, when Jason makes it to the dock from the cruise ship, a dog starts barking at him and he actually kicked it. Kane Hodder, who was actually playing Jason, felt that kicking the dog was going too far. And so the scene was dropped. These are movies where you have this like homicidal maniac running around killing anything that's in his sight with, without any regard for human life whatsoever, but hurting the dog is too much, Corey. It's too much. Hey, that's, I think that's a staple for any horror movie. If, you, if you're going to kick a dog or hurt a dog in any way, that's, that's too much. This is something that kind of made me feel slightly uncomfortable is reading this bit of trivia is that apparently the producers and the directors were desperately trying to get the stars of the film to do nudity and some of them had were very, very uncomfortable doing it. Now, Charlene Martin, who stars in the film, apparently was, was, was very uncomfortable kind of showing her goods. So to put her at ease, the director actually borrowed a page from theatre and film law and stripped down fully nude and walked into the shower to illustrate how easy it all was. Unfortunately, he didn't realise that the camera was actually rolling the whole time. So when the producers the next morning watched the dailies, they were incredibly confused as to why their director was standing completely nude in a shower and talking to one of their lovely young actresses that was just trying to do her best, if you know what I mean. It's, just, it's a strange thing, yeah? Yeah, it really is. You know, Rob Hedden really tried to get Jensen Daggett to do a nude scene in this movie. This is our lead character here, Rennie. The thing was that they they originally had a nude scene with this character, but I guess they just kind of forgot that that was part of the movie and didn't, like, you know, get permission from her as the actress that they cast to do the scene. And, of course, she came back and said, no, I'm not doing it. 
So <laughs> apparently Rob Hedden like really pursued it. Like he was really trying to talk her into it. At first it was like, you got to do the nude scene. She's like, nah. He's like, well, how about topless? Nope, not doing it. He even asked her if she would just so much as like take her blouse off. <laughs> She's like, no, I'm not doing it. And you know what? It's for that reason that she probably didn't get a hell of a lot of screen time. I mean, she does show up predominantly towards the end of the film, but for the first 40, 45 minutes. I mean, she's there, but she's she's almost like a bit part character a little bit. I know. For the lead character, it's kind of strange. And it could have been interesting, though, because, I mean, that's, that's sort of going against type, you know, the lead act, you know, the surviving mm. girl. She doesn't, she doesn't get naked. She doesn't do bad things, you know? So you could see, like, he was trying to go for something, trying to reverse the stereotype there. But, of course, you know, because of all this mix-up and not, you know, <laughs> contracting her to do this, ultimately it just didn't get done. All right. Is there, is there any more trivia that you want to discuss, mate? There is actually a really funny clip. You can see it on YouTube now, but there is footage from when Kane Hodder in full, you know, Jason makeup and everything in character went on the Arsenio Hall show and <laughs> Arsenio's there and he's trying to conduct an interview with Jason and of course Jason doesn't talk and throughout the whole interview Kane Hodder just stays in character, he never says a word <laughs> while Arsenio Hall's trying to interview him. It's actually a really funny video. I think I might post it on the Facebook page. Yeah, yeah, do it, man. I'm gonna, I've got it up on YouTube at the moment. It, uh, I'll have to give that a watch um, at the end. Obviously, we'll talk more as we get into the story, but I'm going to give props to Kane Hodder. He really does kind of establish himself as the ultimate kind of Jason kind of character. And actually, there was, there's another bit of trivia that I forgot to mention as well, is that towards later on in the film, I think Jason walks into a diner when he gets to New York City, and the chef or someone comes from the kitchen and kind of storms towards Jason, and Jason picks him up and throws him at a mirror, and that guy who he throws at the mirror is the guy that actually plays Jason in Freddy vs. Jason a few films later. <laughs> I did not know that. Very interesting. So there you go. But um, yeah, I've got to give props to, to Kane Hodder. He really does establish himself as the Jason kind of character. He, he plays him like he's quite menacing and he's he's quite suspenseful and tense, like if you know what I mean. He does a good job, I think. Yeah, he really does. And of course, he's sticking around for the next two installments of does the he? franchise. Yeah, he's going to continue as Jason for the next two films after this. Yeah, I'm still waiting for Tommy Jarvis to come back. <laughs> 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 Maybe in the reboot, you never know. Yeah, what happened to um the previous actress in the film before, L Law or whatever her name was? Oh, La Park Lincoln. I think I read somewhere that she actually wanted to come back and she asked for a modest kind of pay rise. Well, actually, actually, no. You know, that, that was pretty much the case for all the surviving girls. You know, the actresses wanted more money to come back, to which, you know, Paramount was like, no, we're not going to pay you more money. <laughs> we'll just recast. Mm. Uh, but for La Park Lincoln, she actually genuinely just did not want to come back for this film. She didn't want to do it. Oh, okay, interesting. It's a shame because she was not bad. I th I personally thought, I think we disagreed slightly on it, but I felt that she was not bad in the last film. It would have been nice to see Jason go up against a uh, telekinesis again and just, you know, see him get thrown around New York City or whatever it might have been. <laughs> Obviously, the story would have been very different, but it would have been interesting nonetheless. Well... Shall we get into the main discussion? Oh man, I, I'm, I'm so excited. Let's get into it. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> this film apparently takes place just one year after the previous film, The New Blood. Yeah. So we're now in 2001, apparently, <laughs> according to the timeline. I find those timelines very, very odd. Like the fact that we're in 2001 is just strange. Like they make no effort whatsoever to make it feel like the future, do they? <laughs> Exactly. None. I, and obviously, I don't even think they're thinking about the future. This is a timeline that has sort of been put together after the fact, mm. bringing into consideration any kind of drop lines or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be 2001. But of course, you know, this is still very very obviously steeped in the 80s. <laughs> but you can you can feel the 90s creeping in big time. Like, it's 1989, man, but you look at the fashion of the actors and whatnot, they've all got, like, long hair. It all looks a bit grungy all of a sudden. Like, the big hair from the 80s is still there a little bit, but it's certainly not as prevalent as it was in the last couple of films. Definitely not. That's true. <laughs> but you still feel that uh, that 80s sting oh, to yeah, it, really, very, don't you? Very much so, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
So, getting into this film, it pretty much just, uh, well, it picks up with these two kids, right? They're on a boat at Crystal Lake, and they sort of give us the exposition that they are from the graduating class of the, I guess, the nearby high school, uh, mm. which I think was called, like, Lakeview High or something like that, right? So we just sort of get this exposition, and the dude there, so this is uh, this is Jim and Susie, right? Yeah. And he sort of gives us, like, a little catch-up on the film, you know? No flashbacks this time, but he sort of just relays this legend of Jason's story to Susie to sort of freak her out a bit. And he jumps out at one point with the hockey mask on. First of all, man, they're cruising on the lake that Jason is beneath the surface. And, and they've still got the house in the background. Like, I've said this, I said this in the last film. Burn it down. Why, why have people even go anywhere near this kind of area? It's just, it's, it, it's a big problem for me. The fact that they even let people anywhere near <laughs> Camp Crystal Lake. Dozens and dozens of people routinely die there, Corey. Routinely. I don't even think it's the house anymore. It looks like the camp is back there. And it's operational, like all the lights are on and everything. It's true. It's true. Like there's activity in the background kind of thing. It's like, what's going on? Anyway, you're, you're dead right. We cut to these two people, Susie and Jim. And Jim is kind of doing his best to try and, you know, romance Susie. And, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to have a good time. And Jim tries to like freak Susie out a little bit by telling them the story of Jason. And you're right. He plays that ridiculous prank, which kind of gave me flashbacks to, wasn't there like a, like one of the films, like in three or four where, was it Tommy Jarvis played pranks or there was a character that played really inappropriate pranks on all the other people? Oh, Shelley in part three. <laughs> That's mm. it. She Shelley in part three. That's exactly right. The thing that gets me here though is that, of course, in the last film, the hockey mask broke off. So they need a way to get Jason back in the hockey mask. So they have, you know, the guy jump out and scare her with this retractable knife while he's wearing the hockey mask. But for some reason, this guy has, like, looked into Jason's backstory or something, and it's got, like, you know, the cut in the left side of the mask and everything from where the propeller blade hit him that one time. This guy was, like, method. Like, he did his research in recreating this hockey mask. It was ridiculous. And he takes it off, and the girl is super pissed off. Susie's really pissed off with Jim. And he's desperately trying to apologize. Like, come on, baby. Like, I didn't mean to do it. Yeah, I'm an idiot. Like, don't hold it against me, all that kind of stuff. First of all, the anchor kind of drops to the ground. And there's, there's these, like, electricity cables underneath the water. And it's kind of... Jason is, like, lying underneath the wreckage of the old boat thingamajig. Wherever the zombie dad left him after dragging yeah. him under the water at the end of the last movie. Well, I, I can't lie. That that was my first thought. Where is the dad? Where's the zombie? Da where's the zombie dad? I mean, he's clearly alive, or he, he's clearly underneath the water, but he uh, he he disappeared for some reason. But the electricity, there's like a lightning, and then it kind of connects to the wire, and the and then lightning flies through the water and fires it through Jason's body. So we have the whole electricity angle again that we did in, I think it was number four. It was number six. With the grave. It was number six. Was it number six with the, with, with the grave? So we got that whole angle again and Jason jumps on board. He grabs the hockey mask that, that the, uh, that Jim had kind of left to sitting on the wheel of the boat, puts it on and scares the hell out of Susie and Jim, doesn't he? Jim gets a spear gun through the stomach and all of his, like, guts get ripped out. Yeah, it's pretty gross, actually. And then he goes to kill Susie. And it is, like, the slowest, most retracted kill ever. Yeah. Like, he just, like, slowly pokes this spear at her while she's shrieking for, like, ten minutes. It's like she just lays there and takes it. It's ridiculous. After Susie and Jim kind of, you know, meet their end to, via Jason's hands, and keep in mind, too, the the list of deaths in this film is significant. We're talking 25 people get killed in this film. Yes, 25, but only 23 by Jason's hands. There's two accidents in this movie. Yeah, yeah. so Jim and Susie get done, and then we kind of cut to the establishing sequence for the rest of the film. So the next morning, we get introduced to the SS Lazarus, which is ready to set sail for New York City with the graduating senior class. It's being chaperoned by the biology 
teacher, which is Dr. Charles McCulloch, and the English teacher, Colleen Van Dusen. Now, Van Dusen actually brings McCulloch's niece, Rennie, along for the trip, despite her aquaphobia, apparently, much to his chagrin. And he's a little kind of cranky that uh, this woman brought his niece along with her. It's such a weird setup. And, like, I know we've complained in the past that we haven't got to know characters, but... I mean, they go to some lengths to do some establishing stuff here, which kind of goes nowhere. You know, there's this whole thing about Stephen King's high school fountain pen. I actually thought, as I was watching the movie, I thought to myself, did I mishear that? Did they just say Stephen King owned this? (laughs) I thought, really? I mean, he uses it a weapon later, but I mean, like, her being a good writer really plays into nothing. The fact that, like, her parents are dead and she is now cared for by her uncle who's just this, like, horrible person who's also, I guess, like, the headmaster at the school that she goes to. It's just a weird setup and she just seems to, like, have total animosity for her uncle and loves her teacher, Colleen. Yeah, loves it. Like, and, and Colleen keeps saying to Rennie that, you know, you're, you're the best English student like I've, I've ever had. Like, you've you've got total potential. Like, don't waste it kind of thing, you know. And, and she's really trying to, like, motivate her and she believes in her and she wants to be a mate and all that kind of stuff. And then we meet the uncle who's probably very protective of his niece considering that he is her guardian. But he's a bit of a dick. As well. Like, he's not the nicest guy in the world, is he? <laughs> not at all. I actually think they actually go a little bit backwards with Rennie's storyline in this film because for much of the movie, you're kind of wondering. They keep kind of implying that she's got some kind of connection to Jason. She keeps having these, like, visions throughout the film of, like, a young kind of Jason. But for much of the movie, you're a bit confused as to why it's all happening. And obviously, we'll, we'll divulge a little bit later in the storyline as to why she's having those visions. But they should have explained that more much earlier than they actually did. (laughs) I know. Instead, it looks like they must have cast, like, four different kids to play young Jason. I don't think it was the same kid any time that this vision of young Jason showed up. I mean, at one point when he comes out the mirror, I swear to God, the kid was Asian. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? (laughs) It's just strange. And to be truthful, mate, I was... I was actually a little bit disappointed that they didn't Jason's kind of history a little bit. Like, I thought we'd gone past all that, man. Like, let's stop talking about drowning in the lake and Mrs. Voorhees and all that kind of stuff. Let's just accept the fact that Jason is this supernatural badass that can do whatever he fucking wants (laughs) and is incredibly hard to stop. Exactly. I don't really need to know about what he did as a child when he was eight or, or, you know what I mean? I just don't care. (laughs) We've covered that territory, you know, five, six films ago. I don't need to do it again. So we get all this set up. They're on this cruise ship, which looks like, it looks like it's way too small for all the stuff that's in there. I mean, this has like rooms. It looks like everybody's got their own individual room with like king size beds and ensuite bathrooms. There's a dance floor. There's a boxing ring. There's a sauna. There's a freaking games room. Like (laughs) this ship does not look that big. No, it does not. It's a bit of a strange kind of thing. And they don't, they never really explain how Jason gets from Camp Crystal Lake to the ship as well. He just appears. Yeah, exactly. He? he sort of just jumps up onto the anchor chain and crawls on board. And then the ship, of course, has to get out of the lake and get across to New York. I think that's all like, don't even think about it. Like, <laughs> this is well, this is what we're doing. So just don't let that bog you down. As per usual, we have our expendable young people in this film that um, is, is a staple of all the films. It's a bit, bit hard, kind of hard to explain exactly who they all are because truthfully, most of them are fairly forgettable. <laughs> Something I've got to mention too, like we get introduced to our hero of the film. Obviously, you've got Rennie the girl, but there's a guy as well who is like the son of the captain. <laughs> of the ship and it's this really weird sequence where the captain is standing there and he and he announces to his his fellow crew i'm going to relinquish command of the ship and hand it over to captain such and such yeah sean implying that his son is immediately going to take over and he clearly does like doesn't really have any idea what to do he's ill prepared he doesn't want to do it it's just really he's like <laughs> the daddy's like grandstanding and it's it's borderline funny 
when, when that actually happened, I thought, really? Is this really happening? I know. He kind of, like, makes a mistake or something. He forgets to do the, what is it, the, the international maritime signal with a broadcast or something. So the kid's just like, yeah. fuck you, Dad. <laughs> it storms out. And he runs away like a teenager, doesn't he? <laughs> exactly. And we've also got a uh, another stand-in for Crazy Ralph as well, some sort of deckhead who just sort of appears every now and again and goes, This voyage is doomed. <laughs> You're all going to die. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is what's going on. And, yeah, we, we pretty much, I guess, just get down to it. They establish that there's a lot of kids on here. Like, they show a dance floor at one point, and there's, like, 20 kids <laughs> in there. You never see any of them get killed. But I think they just say at one point, like, Jason's just killed everybody. Apparently, Kane Hodder, after scenes on the dance floor to amuse the crew... Like at the end of a take, we you know do this terrible thing to one of his fellow cast members, and then after the camera stopped rolling, he would do like a disco dance, and he'd make everyone laugh. And apparently, it was great. <laughs> I would love to see that. That's going to be on YouTube. I'm going to find that. Yeah, you should definitely try and look for it. I've, I've never seen it, but it'll be, be a bit of a laugh. <laughs> but yeah, so but we sort of just get like particular kills, right? And it starts with. Like I said, a crime against nature. This is, they kill like the best character first on the ship, JJ. How awesome is JJ? You know, she's all, she's got her like black and pink going on. She's playing yeah, she her guitar. guitar. She's yeah. got her mate Wayne there with his camera. You know, she, she just wants to make a music video, man. <laughs> but that's what I was saying, man. If you look at that character who does the camera, you can feel Seattle in that guy, just in the way he kind of looks and he's buttoned up t-shirt and yeah, he's definitely on the cusp of grunge. <laughs> I think he is anyway. Yeah, well, he's a budding filmmaker as well, so he's probably in on that kind of stuff. <laughs> but yeah, you know, she makes the ultimate mistake, you know. She wants to go down to the engine room to make the music video but wayne is pining over tamara it's not even tamara it's tamara and he has to go and help her out so jj ends up down in this engine room by herself and jason just becomes like freaking houdini here i don't know how he does it but one minute he's behind jj chasing her down Next minute, he's right in front of her, beating her to death with her own guitar. Like we've spoken about, like the concept of supernatural elements in this series before, but they really accentuate it in this film because Jason can move really quickly between places, and you have no idea how. Like it just cut doesn't really make sense that he can do that. He does it later in the film as well, where he's not meant to be on a train. And he just appears there for no mm -hmm. reason. And he's just chasing the, the rest of the people. And that's kind of that. But yeah, he's definitely got these kind of weird traveling powers, doesn't he? Yeah, it's so bizarre in this film. Just the the way he moves around. This I don't know. It's like they must have cut something out or maybe it was intentional. I don't know. But yeah. I don't know what they cut out because this is the longest of all the Jason films. This is an hour and 40 minutes. When I first put this movie on, mate, I checked the running time and I, I let out a groan. I went, Oh, it's an hour and 40 minutes. <laughs> so like I said, there's also some sort of boxing ring in this <laughs> boat. And we get introduced to Julius. And he's like the star boxer. And he's sort of like, like Tamara is like totally impressed with him and stuff. And of course he wins this fight and his opponent, you know, whatever this dude's name is, just nameless boxer dude goes down to the sauna <laughs> where Jason punches a hot sauna rock through his stomach. Yeah, it, it wasn't very it wasn't very nice, but it was it, it was fairly creative. Let's just put it that way. I know. Jason gets very creative in this movie. <laughs> to be fair, Corey, the plot at this stage in the film, it's a bit actually hard to discuss the synopsis because it's it's essentially Jason routinely going from room to room killing whoever's in the room essentially for the first 45 minutes of this movie mixed in with rennie sort of having like flashbacks to the fact that she's afraid of water for some reason yeah and of course images of, of young jason you've also got this like like the teacher being like really protective of rennie and a bit of a tit as well like not a very nice man like there's a scene <laughs> where he kind of confronts one of the students about not doing her homework or something for like something really stupid and she strips off in front of him yeah. and like she's in her underwear and she like seduces him and rather than him immediately saying 
absolutely not. This is totally inappropriate. He kind of gets into it for about 90 seconds and then kind of goes, no, 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 we can't do this. This is a terrible idea. I am your teacher. But Wayne had actually filmed it. So it was actually a ruse all along that was actually going to use it to kind of blackmail the teacher later on in the film. So it was this strange sequence, yeah? Tamara, she is just the worst, isn't she? I mean, she she at one point says that she was the homecoming queen, but for some reason her only friend is this, like, hanger-on chick named Eva. And I'm like, why is she hanging out with Eva? Like, if she's the homecoming queen, why is her only friend this hanger-on? Like, where, where are her friends? Like, you know, in any other teen movie, she would have, like, a squad of cheerleaders or something with her. You never see that with Tamara mm. because she's just a horrible human being. I mentioned the uh, the actress that played Eva was a girl named, named Kelly Hugh. Now, she was in X2 as Lady Deathstrike. She was also in Arrow as China White and she's been in a ton of other things. She's actually got quite a lengthy filmography, like like quite a bit that she's kind of done. So she was the, this is her first kind of film role. So you know, I suppose we we'll kind of, we've always kind of joked that none of these people actually go onto anything, but this is actually one of the examples where where she actually does go into something. But for the most part, they just set up Tamara as this terrible human being. She's making Eva do drugs and she's pushing Renny in the water and all this stuff. She's seducing her teacher. So, yeah, she gets naked in the shower and Jason is just going to bust in and stab her to death with a piece of mirror. And then put their bodies on display to, for, for all the other members of the uh, the people to find in weird places. It's <laughs> I strange. know. That's our next set of kills because he goes ahead and he kills the Admiral, uh, Sean's father, and his, like, uh, you know, his offsider guy, co-captain or... Assi- I don't know, whatever they call it <laughs> assistant captain or something yeah jim is like stabbed to death with a harpoon the captain comes in finds him and then they do this like super slow-mo as jason comes up behind him and slits his throat open it's pretty gross actually and then you kind of got a sequence later on in the film too where the teacher kind of comes up and like this son of of the admiral had kind of uh, realized that his dad's dead and like this the teacher makes this really idiotic comment he goes he's the son of the admiral he should know how to run this ship <laughs> or something stupid <laughs> like that it is just dumb like my dad works with machines i am the least mechanically inclined person you've ever met <laughs> yeah yeah fair you enough. just expect because your dad knows how to do it you do as well it is stupid. It is stupid. Yeah, so this is pretty much the point where it's all kicking off. So before we get into the uh, second half, shall we check out some clips from the first half of the movie? Yeah, let, let's do it, man. Okay, I grabbed this. This is like the first thing you hear, and it's like a reimagining of that kind of thing, but they say Jason. So take a listen to this. This is so weird. That's like the first thing that comes up over the Paramount logo. <laughs> oh my lord, is it really? Yeah. I did not I did not notice that. That's really cool. I felt like that. Just instead of just the normal, let's sort of mix in Jason with it. <laughs> nice. You should play that before we start talking about every synopsis in in in, in the whole series. That's awesome. <laughs> Okay, so I've got the teacher lady arriving at the cruise and talking with uh, the uncle. Nice. Has everyone checked in? No. Jim Miller and Susie Donaldson never showed up, and I'm more than a little concerned. Well, don't be. They probably decided to explore each other rather than New York. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Just explaining away why those two didn't show up. <laughs> he's not really all that concerned. I like how he's going, oh, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> Although I did save this clip to use in the future. I'm more than a little concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to play that time, along with this one. <laughs> oh, nice. I'm saving those clips just in case I need them at some point. Yeah, yeah you're stockpiling them, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> okay, we've got the uh, crazy Ralph stand in. Oh, yeah, nice. This voyage is doomed. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Ugh, the oh so 80s use of the word dweeb. Don't be a dweeb, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> That's JJ. She's so cool. 
And then um, when JJ's trying to tell Wayne that uh, Tamara is just a user. She is a user. She's sexy. So what? So is this guitar. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite good. You and, did a good job. And the last clip for this half is Tamara. And again, this is like such an 80s kind of insult. Nice. Did you care for a hit? No, thanks. Real space cadet. wonder if she'll narc on us. A space cadet. A space cadet. <laughs> Are they doing like cocaine or something like that? It's not like they're just having a joint. They're doing cocaine. <sighs> Heroin's going to come into this later as well. So get ready for that. We'll get to that. We're about we're about five, five or six kills from getting to heroin. But we'll, we'll get there. So so we've got our uh, our heroine, um, no pun intended, Rennie, and she actually begins seeing these like visions for young Jason throughout the ship, and she's doing it all the time. But the others, they're just ignoring the deckhand's warning that Jason is aboard because he just knows like immediately. I don't quite know how he knows, and like you're dead right. Like, he's he, they're trying to do the whole crazy Ralph thing. I don't know if they needed to do it, but. They felt the need to for whatever reason, so they didn't, so that's fine. But, <laughs> you know, we've got Jason. He kills, you know, Captain Robinson and his first mate, and then Rennie's boyfriend, Sean, actually discovers them, tells the others before calling for an emergency ship. We've got Eva is actually strangled as she tries to flee from Jason, and the students actually agree to search for Jason whilst uh, the teacher, McCulloch, decides that the deckhand is actually responsible. He just makes the decision, doesn't he? He goes, the deckhand's responsible, like... <laughs> He has to be responsible. Like, I don't like the look of him kind of thing, you know? And the whole thing with Eva, I mean, strangled on the dance floor. I mean, again, yeah. this is like Jason just, like, teleporting. He's just, like, he's there one second, go on the next, and then suddenly he's right there strangling her to death. Did you ever notice the way Kane Hodder plays Jason is that he takes these... They do these long, these shots of Jason just standing there looking super menacing and he's breathing really heavily and all you see is his torso kind of moving. The guy's got presence, right? Like he just gives Jason real physicality and I think I, like, I, I was thinking about the whole mask thing. Like Jason totally wouldn't work if he didn't have the mask. He would be borderline ridiculous. But the actual mask humanizes him a little bit you don't really think of him as a supernatural kind of creature like you think of him as more like a human type creature he's just got a mask on but he's not really human like on the three or four times he's taken off the mask in the four, last three or four films he's he's a disturbing figure underneath that mask as we'll find out later on in the film and i guess that's what leads julius to sort of like row everyone together because like i said at this point they're just like everybody else must be dead the 50 other kids who came on this cruise they must be dead somewhere. <laughs> With two chaperones. <laughs> two. And, and like, it's not like they're just taking them, you know, to Camp Crystal Lake for a camp. They're taking them to New York City. And I kind of get the impression this is bad New York City. This is late 80s. New York is a shithole. People are kind of, you know, doing heroin in Times Square kind of shithole. Like, and like... It's just, it's, it's a dangerous place, and there's two chaperones for all these kids. It's weird. Yeah. I know. So Julius kind of just takes the reins here, gathers together as many weapons as he can. He's got sticks and axes, and somewhere he found a couple of shotguns. And we cut to Wayne down in, I guess, the bowels of the ship, and he loses his glasses after getting, like, sprayed in the face with some steam or something and he just like accidentally guns down some random crew member yeah <laughs> it's weird and know. then jason shows up and throws him against some sort of electrical control panel or something and that starts a huge fire <laughs> so that's going on and again jason's just like zipping all over the place he has this attack on this uh, the, like just like one of the ancillary kids where he chases him up the i guess the mast of the ship i don't know why a motorized cruise ship has a mast but whatever <laughs> yeah, that's fine <laughs> and he throws him down impaling the kid on some sort of 
I don't know, deck post thing or something. Yeah, it's not very nice. But you're dead right. Like, he's started off this fire, and this begins, like, a, a chain of events that actually eventually causes the ship to sink. So, obviously, it's turned into, you know, James Cameron's The Titanic all of a sudden. And the, the remaining students and adults need to escape the ship as quickly as they can. So, so you've got McCulloch. Van Dusen, um, Rennie and Sean and they escape fairly promptly aboard a life raft but they actually discover Julius is in the water didn't he get thrown in the water yeah so Julius shows up too and on their way out they do come across that deckhand who McCulloch the whole time is like it's the deckhand and he's brandishing a knife and I think McCulloch tries to like shoot him with a flare gun or something but it jams yeah, and then and the gets cranky. yeah, so and then the deckhand falls over with an axe in his back. So obviously, yeah, yeah, yeah. like McCulloch is made to look like the idiot. Like Jason yeah. is real; he is here, and he's killing people. These big scenes, like you need to listen to me. You know what I mean? Jason is alive. You know, so you stop telling us what to do, and like and all that kind of stuff. Even though they're like young adults, they're not kids. These people, they're they're, they're like late teens. Well, I think they're meant to be like late teens. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, yeah, and and they escape on this life right? And it kind of feels like it should be the end of the movie, right? They get to New York and you're like, it, it just feels like the end. But hey, lest you forget, this movie is called Jason Takes Manhattan. So we're going to get into a whole sequence of Jason chasing them around New York. And I got to say, man, I was a lot more engaged. I said this to you earlier in the film. I found just the basic idea of removing Jason from Crystal Lake and putting him to like an urban kind of city type environment a lot more engaging and a lot more interesting. I, I found him roaming around the streets. He looked great and he would have been a sight to see like back in the day like apparently they only shot in new york for two days and i enjoyed the last 35 minutes of this film in fact i'd go as far as to say it saved this film for me like mm. if they didn't do this like i would have given this a big fat don't <laughs> recommend it at all it wasn't that good but the last 35 minutes is great yeah i totally agree so we you know it's it, <laughs> it's kind of terrible actually because not only did they just survive uh you know the ship sinking and then making it to New York, they're immediately mugged by these two gangbangers who are apparently named Holmes and Jojo, and they kidnap Rennie, and this is where it gets kind of full on, because they jack her full of heroin and then try to rape her. I actually found that pretty intense, actually, not very nice at all. I know, it's such a weird thing to stick into this tongue-in-cheek horror film. Well, it was something that I kind of thought was quite... Like, it was quite nasty. It's, it, like, I mean, obviously the film is nasty. I mean, Jason is this terrible human being that kills everyone with all kinds of things. But the fact that these two people robbed this person and they tried to, like, give her... I think he says, oh, you need to be stoned for in order for what I'm going to do to you. And he just injects her against her, her will. And it's it's not very nice at all. And fortunately, and I shouldn't... I, I don't think I've ever used the word fortunately in my life, you know, saying anything to do with Jason, but... Jason shows up at the 11th hour, doesn't he? Yeah, just kills them both. But not before she's injected, though. Like, she's high as a kite, man. I know. She does spend, the, like, the next five minutes just sort of, like, in a heroin daze wandering around the back alleys of New York. So, yeah, so those gangbangers are taken out. <laughs> And then we get yeah. this sequence where Julius confronts Jason, and of course he's going to pull out his boxing skills. <laughs> and for some reason, he continually punches Jason in the hockey mask. Why? Yeah. It's a hockey mask. Yeah, I don't know why he didn't get a baseball bat or do something. The, the, the idea that he felt like he could take Jason down with his fists was a bit far-fetched. And to be truthful, it was ridiculous. But what happens directly after the fight is worth its weight in gold oh, because uh, awesome. I think he he kind of exhausts himself and he's t totally exhausted and he I think he says to Jason is the I think he says something like do your best or something like that yeah yeah give me your best shot give me your best shot and Jason punches him and he punches his head clean <laughs> off which I did not expect <laughs> oh man that is just ah oh, that's gonna be one of the best kills right in the whole movie. <laughs> 
Oh, dude, in the whole series. Oh, that's like, awesome. ser- I mean, there's a there's a lot of great kills, but that was certainly one of the more creative ones. I mean, they really <laughs> did lead up to it because the preceding sequence of Julius trying to fight Jason was ridiculous. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. Yeah. Like, w- what a bad decision to make. What happens next, too, is because they actually come across a cop, and this cop's like, he's genuinely trying to help them, right? Yeah. And they get pushed into, like, the back of the cop car, and he's going to, you know, take them away. He's on the radio. Jason comes in, drags the cop away, and they suddenly realize that, that like, Julius's head is now sitting in the front of the cop car. <laughs> and they make a big point of, as the head falls down, the says, it falls into a garbage bin, and the garbage bin closes? Yeah, exactly. So Jason went down, took the head out of the garbage bin, and then stuck yeah. it in the front of this cop car. Yeah, I know, which is just strange. <laughs> So once again, we've got the sadistic side of Jason where he likes to taunt his victims. But I, I, something that I kept thinking about too is when they got to New York City, it's like, how did Jason find these people that were on the boat? Like, New York City's a big place. It's true. He could have split up. But, it, but again, we kind of come back to the concept that Jason is this supernatural being that can kind of move in any way, shape or form and do anything. Like, he's, I, I think he's got some kind of connection to these people somehow. That he mm. just can, he can follow them somehow. I, they never really explain that, and truthfully, they don't really need to. Like it's just you just accept it. And then the next thing too, because you would think that um, Colleen's death would be like a big tra- traumatic thing, right, for Rennie to witness. You know, like the mother in the last one. You know, kind of make it impactful. But instead of her being killed by Jason, she accidentally dies when they recklessly drive off in the cop car and. It, crashes and explodes with her inside it's kind of yeah like it's not like huge for this woman who's like supposed to be like a, a you know a, a very impactful figure on Rennie's life she's just kind of just killed in a car explosion and then once this actually happens then the big reveal actually occurs of why Rennie has this you know agoraphobia like she's scared of water and they actually do a bit of a flashback to see her like holidaying at Camp Crystal Lake when she was younger and she's on the water and McCulloch is there and he's a total dick he's a total A-grade dick and he says to the little girl who's like six, seven or eight years old or something like that, he says, Jason Voorhees is down there and he died when he, he was such and such. And if you can't swim, he will pull you under. So you have to swim. And she says, he's not down there. And he goes, yes, he is. And he actually pushes the little Rennie into the water and she can't swim. She's drowning. And she actually gets pulled underneath the water by the young Jason Voorhees and she kind of confronts him there and then, doesn't she? Yeah, exactly. She gets annoyed, she storms off, Sean goes after her, so McCulloch is just left alone to be picked up by Jason and thrown into a random barrel of sewage or something. Of green <laughs> sewage. It's really <laughs> weird and it's disgusting. Did you notice that shot that they did earlier on in the film when they got to New York City of the rat? And uh, and there was like a, there was a shot of a rat and they stayed on it for ages. Yeah, like crawling out of that sewage yeah. barrel. Yeah, it was like a minute of the rat just looking at the camera. And I thought, really? <laughs> Are they really going to like just cut away from this at some point? And it was actually a good shot because, like, you know, McCulloch is running away from Jason and he runs into this derelict building and then the next second, he's being thrown out of, like, the second-story window. <laughs> I'm like, so that was a pretty good staging, yeah? It was a pretty good stunt there. But, uh, yeah, 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 him being thrown upside down into this barrel of sewage. And this isn't the last time we're going to see some green liquid here, because the next part of it is just Jason chasing Sean and Rennie around New York, through Times Square, on a subway. Something that we forgot to mention, what did you think, and this is going back a little bit, sorry to backtrack, but when they first get to New York City, what did you think of the very first shot of Jason getting off the boat and seeing the big billboard of the hockey mask? (laughs) It was just a bit silly, right? It was a bit silly, but it made me laugh. I didn't, re- I, 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 I wasn't expecting it. And then Jason turns to the camera and he breaks the fourth wall for a moment. It is kind of bizarre. It is strange. Anyway, so I had, I had to just throw that in. I forgot to mention it. So yeah, so they're being chased through New York, and like we said, like New York's just made out to be like just this shitty place where nobody's helping they're screaming for help people are everywhere but jason is just fixated on chasing these two down they even run into a diner at one point (laughs) 
<laughs> and they don't do anything to help until Jason comes crashing through their wall. And like we said, there's this random cook who confronts him and gets thrown into a mirror. He also runs into some thugs at Times Square and he breaks their boom box or something <laughs> like that. And they get cranky with him and they they, they, they get their knives out. And he's like, oh, I'm going to come and get you. And, and then he takes off his mask for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> I actually didn't mind all that kind of stuff. Like I know you said that the the scene with the hockey mask, you know, when he got off the scene was a bit silly, but it shows there's a, there's a little bit of levity in the film. Like it's not taking itself entirely seriously. Like and and nor should it. It doesn't need to be like a super serious kind of horror film, yeah? No, nah, not at all. But at the same time, I mean, this ending is just baffling, right? I mean, we've had some baffling endings to these films, like the zombie Mrs. Voorhees coming out of the lake that time. Like, what was yeah. that about? This, I don't know what happened. They end up down in the sewers. They come across a random, like, sewer worker guy who's like, hey, we've got, like, ten minutes until all of this is flushed with toxic waste for some reason. Every night at midnight, it kind of <laughs> floods or something stupid <laughs> like that. And sure enough, you know what's going to happen. Yeah, he gets bashed in the head with a wrench, and they're on the run. And this toxic waste, like, engulfs Jason. Mm. and the mask comes off again, and it looks really freaking gross this time. He's, like, spewing up water and stuff. But the next thing, he is kind of, like, melted away, and all that's left there is the body of a child. Yeah, I couldn't work out if Rennie and... Sh so, I know Rennie saw it, but did Sean see it? I, I kind of got the impression he did, but you, they didn't make that clear, did they? I know, and it's not like, you know, suddenly it was just, like... Jason's an innocent child again, and they sort of help the kid up out of there. They just walk away. I'm like, I have no idea what this means. They don't just walk away. They go away and find their dog. I know. We haven't even mentioned him, but yeah, she had Toby the dog with her the whole time. And they do a bit of a, uh, a thing at the end there where they kind of pretend. They do like a, a point of view shot that you think is Jason. It kind of creeps up on Rennie and Sean, and then they should do the reveal, and it's the dog. Anyway, it is what it is. Exactly. And that's the end of the film. Well, yeah, he turns to her and says, hey, I, I hear there's this 21-story statue that we can go and climb. And I'm like, um, girl, you were stuck with heroin before by a couple of junkies. Like, you want to go and get yourself checked out at the hospital, maybe? Like, it was just, it, that could have just been the filthiest needle. Like, you could have, no. like, HIV or something now. Like, he was concussed before as well. So, like, maybe the two of you should just get to a hospital. I don't think now's the time to go and climb the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> Especially after her uncle just died <sighs> and her best friend, the, the English teacher, her mentor has died. Like, And she, her parents are dead. She's got nothing, man. She's only got Sean. And I'm, tr tell I'm telling you now, like, as much as I like Sean, he's not the toughest bloke in the film. Like, <laughs> even like there's a scene like in the sewer down where I think... Like Jason runs into someone and Sean actually passes out. He like he gets he, he gets his head gets knocked against the wall and he just falls down. That's it's called a concussion. He's the only one that gets concussed. But that's okay. He's, <laughs> he he did his he did his best. But even to be truthful, the casting of Sean probably wasn't great. Like they really <laughs> kind of went with like a mid eighties kind of, you know, Breakfast Club Emilio Estevez type kind of look, if you know what I mean. Like This guy was no Emilio Estevez. <laughs> Sorry. He's like the bland version of Amelia Westerberg's. But yeah, baffling ending. I have no idea what that was all about. <laughs> and that's it. That's that's Friday the 13th, part eight. So the question is, like, does, like, how do they bring Jason back for the next film? Because, I mean, we have four more films to watch, man. Is Jason, like, this child now? Oh, man, it's it, it kind of irks me a little bit, the fact that they try to do serious kind of drama and narrative with Jason. Like, just accept that he's this crazy supernatural badass and, and we can all get on with our lives. I just don't, I don't need all the kid stuff, you know? It's too much, man. All right, some more clips from the second half of the film, hey? I was going to say more clips, definitely. We got McCulloch here, screaming, screaming about uh, Jason. Walking corpses are not real. <laughs> yes, they are, mate. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> yes, you're gonna yes, find out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's right. We got Ju Julius stepping up to the plate. I say we regroup and let's go find this motherfucker before he finds us, huh? Are you with me? Watch your mouth, young man. <laughs> People are dead, and he's worried about <laughs> Julius's language. 
Yeah, I know, I know. Even like McCulloch is worried. Like they're, they're like there's a scene earlier in the film where they just get to New York and they're in the car, like driving away from Jason. And McCulloch tells the driver to slow down. He says, "Slow <laughs> down, you're, you're driving too. <laughs> Don't drive so fast." <laughs> Don't, and yeah. He's like, "Dude, you, you're driving away from a maniac. It's fine to drive fast. It's fine. Just do it." <laughs> I do have two other clips of uh, McCulloch just. <laughs> <laughs> trying to maintain control. Nice. I'm in charge here. <laughs> he says okay. that like three times. That's an, that's another clip for the uh, the uh, the bank dude. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in charge here. <laughs> he also says this. I'm the one you should be listening to. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh my god, it's uh, very funny. He's the worst. He also had this terrible idea. Well, look, I think we'll be. More productive if we split up, okay? Hyper Charles, Colleen, suppose we... no discussions now, please. <laughs> Let's just <laughs> split up. <laughs> to be fair, he's fairly quotable in this film, isn't he? Like, he's got a lot of pretty good lines. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. I have that uh, very unhelpful waitress. Oh, nice. Look, you've got to call the police. There's a payphone in back, but it's broke. Look. You don't understand. There is a maniac trying to kill us. Welcome to New York. <laughs> oh, my God. I love how they paint everyone in New York City to be a total A-grade dick. <laughs> exactly. And uh, the last clip I have is actually a snippet from the theme song from this movie. Oh, Did you? Yeah, nice. They played it at the beginning, and then they played it on the end credits. This song yeah. is called The Darkest Side of the Night by a band called Metropolis. Nice. Do it. <laughs> nice one, man. Man, I I actually have that whole song on my phone in my iTunes. <laughs> I could listen to that song any day. That song is awesome. Did you know that song prior to the movie? I did not. <laughs> I specifically got that song after watching this movie. <laughs> nice. I'm I'm glad the podcast gave you something. I know. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I just walking down the street, maybe doing some grocery shopping. Blasted my Metropolis. <laughs> do they have actually, do they have more songs or was that the only one? We should really look them up, I guess. <laughs> Let's see if they got an album. I'm sure there's a best of them and I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> okay, so I, I guess it's that time. Ratings recommend, what do you say? This is two films for me. I think we're going to have be fairly agreeable with each other, truthfully. Yeah, I think it's two films. The first half is this strange kind of jason on a cruise ship and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense i i really just wish they trusted their instincts because this could have been one of the better films in the franchise certainly one of the more memorable ones because it was a good decision to try and remove jason and the gang away from camp crystal lake because that whole trope was getting a little bit tired by the eighth film so to actually get him into an urban setting was actually interesting you know to be truthful i was actually quite excited about seeing this film because i knew it was something a bit different from camp crystal lake and into new york so there was a big part of me that was super disappointed with this film because i just didn't really like the first 45 50 minutes i didn't really i mean the characters were fine but it just felt like they were just going through the motions but as soon as the film got to new york city it came alive for me i found it interesting i found the action interesting i like their depiction of new york city and and the thug life and jason being a total badass and a supernatural badass to boot like i could have really done with another you know 20 30 minutes of that and i think the film would have been a considerably better film i think it would have been nice to have like less kills and a little bit more new york city and a little bit more jason just kind of running around that would have been kind of cool to see so as far as rating recommends i think i'm going to go right in the middle about five disgusting jason pairs of pants 
out of ten. Wow. That's kind of where I'm at, where I'm at. I think I'm about a five. Yeah. I'm surprised that you that you're just giving it the middle of the road because yeah, you know, even though you know the first like two thirds of this movie is just Jason on the cruise ship, you know, it's our classic Jason. You know, just Jason killing teens, doing what he does, kind of creative here and there. I actually kind of like the fact that they sort of have this like supernatural teleporting ability where he can just show up at any point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even if you think he's right behind you, no, he's actually in front of you. It's weird and it doesn't really make sense, but <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of fun. But you're right. Once they get to New York and he's chasing them around and in the back streets and stuff, it's actually a lot of fun, you know, even though there's not much going on in the way of the killings and blah, blah, blah. It's just a, a weird look at like how people viewed what new york must be like yeah in the late 80s i guess like i don't think it's this is an honest depiction of it but it's still kind of interesting because of course today like new york's all about the glitz and the glamour and central park and broadway and if you want to make something of yourself go to new york you know that's what it's like today that's our perception of it but yeah back in the late 80s it was all about drug deals or mug you and jackie full of heroin and rape you <laughs> it's a weird time capsule but it's a lot of fun with jason chasing them around so i'm actually going to go a bit higher and i'm going to give this seven cruise ships out of ten nice I think the only reason I gave it five because it, like I'm really discerning it as two separate films, so it goes right down the middle for me. If it had another fifteen to twenty minutes in New York, I, I think I would have been totally there with you. Mm. Seven, seven and a half, like that kind of level. But because the first half of the film just felt a bit laboured and a little bit like tropey to me, it just didn't really work as well as it should or could have for me. But you know, each to their own. Well, you know what I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. I'm more than a little concerned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the boss around here. <laughs> I'm in charge here. <laughs> That's a nice one. So what's happened, Corey? It's 1989 and we don't get another film for four years. What's going on? I know, four whole years. Like I said, Paramount's kind of done with the franchise. They sell it on to New Line, which would mm. make you believe, hey, maybe we're finally going to get that Freddy versus Jason crossover. Not quite. Mm, not <laughs> Still yet. not there for that. Instead, we're going to have Sean S. Cunningham, the original director, return to the series, and he's going to bring us Jason Goes to Hell, the final Friday. Apparently, part four was the final, but no. <laughs> as far as Sean S. Cunningham's going to tell us, part nine is the final Friday. So, for more great podcasts, make sure you guys head over to Golden Spiral Media. You can go to goldenspiralmedia.com slash apple to find everything that the network has to offer. And, of course, remember to join us on Facebook. We're at facebook.com slash rewatchpodcast and on Twitter at rewatchpod. So, give us a follow. And also, give us a rate and review. That is always very much appreciated. And you can find us on pretty much any podcast app of your choice. And that really helped out the show, guys. All right, Nathan, thank you as always for joining me. No problem at all. There's three more to go or four. There's four, isn't there? Nine, 10, 11, 12, mm -hmm. isn't there? That's right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Bring it on. So that'll just leave me to say, until next time, night time is the right time. <laughs> now... I say we regroup and let's go find this motherfucker before he finds us. Are you with me? Golden Spiral Media and the Rewatch Podcast are not associated with the copyright holders of these films and no copyright infringement is intended. They were making love while that young boy drowned. The use of any and all copyrighted material is solely for parody, news analysis, critique, for educational purposes, as provided in United States Code Title 17, aka Fair Use. It's gonna take more than poking the ribs to put down this old dark. Music provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. Cool, JJ. Parents really came through. Copyright 2017, Golden Spiral Media. Meat slime bag!